What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 125. Today, we're going to be talking about King Tut and the Curse of the Pharaoh. If you've never heard about the Curse of the Pharaoh before, I think you're going to be kind of uh, shook a little bit at the end of this because personally, I think the Curse of the Pharaoh could very much be real. Yes. Uh, and with everything going on and, you know, one of the big things and reasons why we're actually covering this is because King Tut has actually been removed from his tomb and the coffin's been removed as well because they're actually restoring it. So there's a lot of people that believe that perhaps the curse of the Pharaoh could be impacting what's going on in the world uh, this year. So because 2020 has been just insane. I mean, it's like every Seriously. day, the craziest news. Seriously. It's like one thing after another. You feel like we never get a break from all the craziness, but for real. So maybe it does all go back to a curse. That yeah, really it, it really could. So <laughs> that's what we're going to be diving into today. But we've got a couple uh, news topics as well. We want to share with you guys, but also we wanted to remind you that Kendall and Janelle are going to be launching their new podcast, The Sesh in what, a week? Yeah, August 9th is our first upload date. And we'll be uploading video and audio. So just like Mile Higher. Yeah, we're really, really excited. We've been waiting a long time to get started on it. So super stoked that it's finally here. And we actually want to play you guys the trailer that we have as well. So let's play it now. Hi, friends. Welcome to The Sesh. We're your hosts, Kendall Ray and Janelle, and we are cousins and also have been best friends for our entire lives. You may know us from Mile Higher Podcast, where we talk about true crime, conspiracies, paranormal things such as aliens and ghosts, but this show is going to be a little different. We may talk about those topics from time to time, but we also are interested in a variety of other topics such as current events, personal topics such as mental health, telling personal stories from our lives growing up together, and giving advice to our listeners, astrology and spirituality. And we'll also have some less serious episodes where we play games, react to viral things on the internet. We're going to even try and cook some things, maybe do a little crafting here and there, which we're not too good at those things. So it could be very interesting. But the bottom line is we really just want to have fun on this show. We hope that the show evolves with you guys and hearing your feedback about what you like to see. And we also hope to have some guests on the show in the future as well. Each episode will drop every Sunday on the platform where you usually listen to your podcasts. And we will also be putting a visual video version on YouTube. The show will be launching on August 9th, so be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. Subscribe on YouTube as well and follow us on social media at the underscore sesh podcast. So we'll see you guys at the first sesh, but, but until, until then, then, keep it fresh. So yeah, we are really, really excited. We can't wait to launch the show. We had great feedback from you guys so far, and we're excited to really connect with people in a more personal way than we do on Mile Higher. So it'll be really fun. Definitely make sure you're subscribed on YouTube. We'll have the link below because we have our channel up and ready to go and click the notification bell if you want to be notified when we upload our first show. Yes. And we might even be on iTunes and Spotify by the time that this episode goes up. You have to like submit, you know, a trailer and then they have to approve it to get it up there. But if it is up, we will link it below so you guys can subscribe there as well. But let's go ahead and get into our news topics for the week. We wanted to update you guys on a story we covered last week about Hannah Potts. So if you didn't hear it, there was this girl named Hannah Potts who went missing and her family was pleading on social media for people to help find her, to raise awareness about her. And she also had posted this Facebook video that was going around the internet that was saying that she had been kidnapped. And she specifically said that she had been kidnapped by a black man in a maroon car. She said she was being held in some room. And honestly, and most of you guys said this last week, it really seemed fake. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know what you guys think of it, but I got fake vibes. I yeah. did too. It seemed acted out and just yeah. didn't seem very sincere. No, it made it, her voice even sound like she was trying to come across as like, yeah. I'm desperate and in need. I'm, you know, kind of that, you know, feel, feel bad for me type of, of yeah. vibe to it. So it was pretty obvious. I think that there was one part in particular where she was like, he's, he calls me baby girl and I don't like yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. It was I weird like things it. like that. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you, I feel like if you got on, you know, a Facebook live and you really were being abducted, you'd be like, okay, where am I? Like start naming things around you and yeah, describing the person more than 
she even did and where she was or just anything other than just, it was, it was weird. It did not come across as, you know, legitimate at all. But I, I feel like most people and myself included, you know, didn't want to judge her at first because you never know, you don't know, like it could have been real. So, you know, I posted that she was missing and tons of people posted. It went really, really viral. But literally the day that it really started going viral later that day, they announced that she was not kidnapped. They had found her and it was not an abduction. And we kind of covered this last week and mentioned, I actually got one thing wrong. I wanted to clarify. I said that they found her in a house rental. And this was just from what subscribers were telling me. And, you know, there was a lot of rumors going around the internet, but it was a house. However, this piece of information didn't come out until this week. There's two other people involved in this and it was their house that she was hiding out at. So it's all set up. Yeah, it's all a setup. It was literally all orchestrated by Hannah and then this woman named Maria Hopper and this guy named Josh Thomas. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I, I, I <laughs> oh forgot to tell you that I was in on this. But. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> God. So apparently the police actually subpoenaed her phone records. And, you know, phone records don't lie. It's hard no. to fake phone records. So once they got the phone records and actually looked through them, they quickly found out that Hannah and Maria were like, teaming up on this together <sighs> to try to set Idiots. this up. Idiots. I don't understand. What do you think you're not going to get caught doing that? They're going to look at your phone records when you're being abducted. And then they see her just planning it all out. Yeah. So actually when police went to the house and, and ended up searching the house because they agreed to let them do so. Yeah. The officer who was walking through the house saw a stairway that led to the basement. And when the officer asked about the stairway, Maria said there wasn't anything down there. However, there ended up being a small little enclosed space that was blocked mm -hmm. off. And at first Maria told officer that there was nothing in that area and that it was just full of spiders. What <laughs> officers like, so what? So it's like <laughs> one gonna, of those spiders are going to stop me from going in there. <laughs> I know, like, seriously, what the hell? Yeah. But so it's one of those like uh, Harry Potter type, like a staircase. crawl space type okay. thing. Yeah. Gotcha. So at first, yeah, she's telling them that, you know, there's too many spiders to go in there, but eventually she just got nervous and admitted to the police that Hannah was actually hiding in there. So they opened it up and she's in there and she had a handcuff on her right arm and shackles on her ankles, which they didn't force her to wear. I mean, maybe it's to really get the, you know what I mean? When like actors try to live, get a into real character. Yeah. 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 Cause she said she was writing a manuscript or like a novel. For re she said she did this for research purposes. Research purposes. For this manuscript she was writing. How which, can you be so stupid thinking that you're going to get away with this? I don't yeah. understand. To me, this is just as bad as, as swatting someone. Oh, way worse. It's way worse than that. Yeah, I mean, it definitely deserves at least the same punishment, in my opinion. Yeah, and they're going to get in trouble. And now that there's three involved, wow. And she had been rehearsing that post that she made to Facebook for a week. How insane. So all three of these dumbasses are facing a class A misdemeanor charge and they're facing preliminary charges of false informing, which is punishable by up to one year in jail and a fine up to $5,000. So to me, they better get that one year in jail or at least at least 60 days in at the minimum. <laughs> like, I mean, the fact that the FBI got involved in this and resources were wasted on her is just so infuriating when there's so many cases that actually need, you know, those same resources. It's just... I don't know what the fuck this, these people were thinking. I don't, I don't get it, man. I, I just don't understand how some cases that actually need help from the authorities mm -hmm. just get overlooked mm -hmm. when there's tons of evidence to suggest that this needs to be investigated further. Yet the first little girl that puts a little video yeah. up on Facebook, well, cause she got gets people all the upset. attention. That's what they go investigate. I literally was watching uh, this TikTok thing. This girl was filming her neighbor. There was a pizza outside of her neighbor's apartment for like days and the police wouldn't do anything about it. And she kept trying to get them to do a welfare check because she was like, they're probably just dead in there or something. And then she got so many people upset on TikTok and they started calling the police. And then the police came and actually went in and they actually told her the only reason we are going in is because there were so many complaints from social media. And that's just a small TikTok story. It wasn't even a huge viral thing. That's what matters these days. That's what they follow up on is when people are causing, you know, a fuss about it. If enough people call, they'll do something. And that's why it's so important to spread these things. 
except yeah, for in Hannah's case, obviously. Yeah, it's really interesting how sort of criminal justice is evolving with the times and mm -hmm. how social media is really becoming a really a powerful tool yeah. to help you get law enforcement's help with mm -hmm. a case. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and not not in all cases do they actually help. It seems like they kind of pick and choose what they what yeah. they want to to work on, but mm -hmm. I, I wonder how the future is going to play out, you know, as social media gets more and more popular and more, you know, at some point you got to think, you know, over time that as the older generations are no longer around that, you know, everybody's going to be raised on social media and stuff like, you know, what if instead of calling 911, you're tweeting the department to, for help or, you know, it's just, I find it interesting how social media is going to impact law enforcement and criminal justice and what that process is going to look like mm -hmm. and how are they going to deal with people like Hannah Potts that, right. you know, people are going to exploit that. And, you know, just like I mentioned with swatting, people are anonymously, you know, reporting people of doing these crazy heinous crimes. And yet, you know, there's no proof of it, but the law enforcement has to react to it just like it is real. So mm -hmm. I, I worry about the future because I feel like it's only going to get crazier in the sense that people are going to take advantage of, you know, being in, in this online world where you can be anonymous. You can be an anonymous Twitter account and, you know, or anonymous, you know, Facebook account to some extent and, you know, post false things and, you know, get people on board with these false crimes that are being committed. And, well, and you know, Hannah wasn't even anonymous. She was just straight up. You know, Which yourself, yeah, so but. super dumb. <laughs> yeah, I really I don't understand what the thought process was with all this. It seems pretty stupid. Like I don't know how she thought she was gonna. Do you think know, that her crazy. reasoning for research was gonna purposes was going to be the right thing? Well, or? she would have gotten in trouble. I don't know. Maybe she, did she plan to be gone forever? Did she plan to run away from home and write a book and have it like anonymously released? Or was she aware that eventually they would find out that she wasn't kidnapped and they would just be like, oh, it's all good because you were doing research for your fucking book? Right. I don't understand it. It just is like. Well, it's one thing just to go missing and not telling tell anybody. Right. And right. you can do that. You can but do that. to ask for help and say I've been kidnapped when you yeah. haven't. What the fuck? You well, can't and, do that. And you're putting other people's lives at risk. If you yeah. think, I mean. Think about if there was a black man right. in the type of vehicle she was in and the cops show up and mm -hmm. they pull a, a random guy over and something goes wrong. And we've seen this happen time and time again where somebody's, you know, completely innocent and they end up dead as a result of, you know, a false report or something. Yeah. So no, it happens it's really for sure. Scary, it's honestly. really serious. I hope they, yeah, get the the harshest sentence. Honestly, I think it should be more than a year. Yeah. I think they need to bring really the hammer serious. down on this and shut this kind of activity down. Yeah. Let us know what you think in the comments below. All right, moving on to Texas has banned smokable hemp. Which, to clarify, they have banned the sale of smokable hemp. I guess you can still buy it online and have it in your possession. Mm -hmm. You just can't go out to a, you know, a shop that sells CBD flour and buy it anymore. Kind of like a lot of places have banned uh, Kratom. But why? I guess because they're afraid that officers won't be able to tell the difference between it. That could be one reason. I think that's probably one of the biggest reasons is they've probably had issues with law enforcement arresting people with hemp flour. Because if you look at hemp mm -hmm. flour and marijuana side by side, very they similar. look very, very similar. And, and honestly, hemp flour does still kind of have a, a smell to mm -hmm. it. So if, you do, yeah. if you're not well versed in cannabis, then yeah, you could be easily yeah. fooled into thinking that hemp flower is actually marijuana as well. Shouldn't they just teach them how to tell the difference though? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you can really visually look at it and just say for sure, but or maybe it would be easy just to legalize all of it. <laughs> that would be the, <laughs> the simple answer there for sure. Yeah. But it's just like, of course, Texas wants to, you know, mm -hmm. clamp down on it even more. It's just so stupid because they're trying to go in the reverse of the way the rest of the country is going. You know, like smokable hemp. Really, you're going to outlaw that or ban that? Yeah, it seems really backwards. I honestly think it's really dumb that you can still, like we said, you can still possess it, but you can't grow it. You can't manufacture it. You can't process it. You can't distribute it. You can't sell it. Okay. So, but if you have it, okay, but you can't like, you you're can't not allowed make to get it, it, but right. If somehow you did, if somehow then you get it, then okay. It's like, yeah, it's not very clear. And it's federally legal. Hemp is federally exactly. legal. So why, why is the state now able to override the federal law? 
the way our fucking laws work in this country are just mm-hmm. beyond my you know, understanding because yeah. it just makes no sense how yeah. one can override the other. And in certain circumstances, you know, you're going to be a criminal under this law, but then mm-hmm. in, you know, under the federal law, you're, you're completely fine. It just makes no sense whatsoever. And just seems like a way to keep people from getting the medicine they need. Mm-hmm. That's all I see. And it truly is a medicine. I mean, I use it as a medication. I know tons of people use it as a medication. There's so many people that could be that are using more harmful things and don't have access to it. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And if you don't know anything about the hemp conspiracy, we have a whole podcast on it because there's a complete conspiracy around it. Absolutely. It's not, I don't even want to call it a conspiracy because that's like, well, no, it is. It is. Yeah. It's a conspiracy. Yeah. There's a, there's a bunch of people conspiring against Mm -hmm. cannabis as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. So it really is. So yeah, check that episode out. We'll link it below. But the last little story we want to talk about is about a place called Zug Island. Now, I'm not even sure if we've ever even talked about this on the the podcast before. I don't think we have. Uh, Actually, we may have in like a ponder sesh at one point, but I don't remember. Yeah, I think I think in one of our past episodes where we talked about sounds coming from the sky and things mm-hmm. like that, uh, sky quakes and all that. We've, we talked we've about a lot of that. It. Unexplained noises, yeah. you know, that people hear around the world. Mm-hmm. So this this particular uh, place, Sug Island, is notorious for having this loud hum. And it's literally this little island in between Canada and the U.S. And people who live around this area, specifically on the Canadian side, for like a decade now, have reported hearing this loud, mysterious hum coming from this island. And I have a little clip of it so you can kind of hear how annoying the sound is. It's that rumbling noise, though. It's not really a hum. It's more of like a rumble. That Sounds you like hear. a white noise machine. Yeah. Sounds kind of nice. <laughs> people, different people that have talked about it have kind of reported it sounding different from each other, but they just call it the Windsor hum. Huh. But it's really more of like a rumbling noise, just this kind of yeah, it really doesn't constant noise that's been going on. And so it's probably hard to pick it up on camera, though. I'm sure it's different for the people that are actually there. Mm-hmm. Right. So people that have, you know, heard this and live around this area have been really upset with this noise, obviously, because that's super annoying to live and have to hear that loud, uh, annoying sound all the time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people have been trying to get it shut down and try to figure out what's causing it. And what's been weird about it is that uh, the actual island is owned by U.S. Steel. And so it's a big steel plant there, which obviously there's a lot of heavy machinery there and stuff. So there's definitely, you know, man-made things there that could cause this noise. But what's interesting is that the Zug Island is completely protected by security. Like it's got, it's fenced. They have security in the water around it that patrol it. It's kind of like an area 51 situation where you're not allowed to go to it. They, they keep it very, you know, secretive and and off limits and they've never come out and said what's causing it or why it's happening. And so people have been really upset about it. And not only that, people have started coming up with like conspiracy theories about it, of course. Like, well, if it's not just, you know, steel equipment making this noise, is there something else going on there? And Mm -hmm. people have speculated like they've got an underground military base there. They're doing experiments there, you know, all the way up to like aliens, you know, you know how conspiracies go. Yeah. So people have been all over the place about it. But apparently the hum is no more because apparently the steel company that's there ramped down production as a result of the virus and therefore the hum has gone away. Wow. So it was the steel company. So after all, it was uh, apparently the blast furnaces that they have there created this noise. So they just figured that out. (laughs) Well, they just got official confirmation of it. Like they actually figured out that it was that because it stopped. The production stopped there. Like if most of the employees who worked there already knew that. Yeah, I mean, how I'm much sure of a mystery everybody, really was it? It wasn't really a mystery, but the thing about it was is nobody would ever come out and publicly acknowledge that it was them. They would refuse to say it was them. Probably because they don't want to acknowledge it because then the people could sue them for the annoying noise or, you know, complain about it or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. They well, don't want to like acknowledge that it's happening. Well, it was weird because they're kind of like this untouchable entity. Like they even mm. try to get the government involved, but the government mm. wouldn't do anything about it. It was like this whole big, big fight up there. And if, 
any of you out there live in this area, you probably know, you know, more about what people's experiences with this, but this has been going on for years. So you can imagine how pissed people are that yeah. they're not controlling this or not regulating it. And this company is just allowed to, to do all of this and create this noise without telling anybody what it is, at least, you know, wouldn't you feel better if there was an unexplained noise, knowing what it was, <laughs> as opposed to wondering yeah, what it was. Of course, but yeah, they don't want to acknowledge it because that's admitting there's a problem and an annoyance for the people there. True. Yeah. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get into Tutan Common. Yes. King Tut. But before we do, we'd like to thank our first sponsors for today. During these economically turbulent times, everyone is looking for a way to feel more financially secure. So if you're still needlessly throwing money every month at high interest credit card debt, it's time you checked out Upstart, the revolutionary online lending platform that knows you're more than just a credit score. Now is the time to find out how low your Upstart rate can be to help pay off high interest credit card debt. Unlike other lenders, Upstart can reward you based on your education and job history in the form of a smarter rate. You don't need a degree or a diploma to apply though. Upstart makes it fast and simple to check your rate. Since it's just a soft pull, it won't affect your credit score. The hard pull happens if you accept your rate and proceed with your application. Over 400,000 people have used Upstart to pay off credit cards or meet their financial goals. Free yourself from the burden of high interest credit card debt and get back to using your money your way with Upstart. See why Upstart has 4.9 out of 5 rating on Trustpilot and hurry to upstart.com slash mile higher to find out how low your Upstart rate can be. Checking your rate only takes a few minutes. That's upstart.com slash mile higher. Do you feel like you have a megawatt smile to show off? No? Well, if you're not confident with your smile, my friends over at Candid can help. Candid has clear liners that are comfortable, removable, and totally invisible, unlike wire braces. So you can transform your smile without anybody noticing. Plus, your treatment is prescribed and monitored by a licensed orthodontist and an expert in tooth movement. Candid only works with orthodontists, never general dentists like other companies. And with some of those other companies, you may never hear from a doctor as you go through your treatment. With Candid, your treatment includes remote monitoring by the same orthodontist that created your plan. So they're with you every single step of the way. And the best part is it costs about 50% less than Invisalign. So get started today from the comfort of your own home with Candid's risk-free starter kit and $75 off. Just go to candidco.com slash mile higher and use the code mile higher. That's candidco.com slash mile higher code mile higher for your risk-free starter kit and $75 off candidco.com slash mile higher code mile higher. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about Tutankhamun, better known as King Tut. Because we need to understand who he was a little bit about his history before we actually talk about the curse of the Pharaoh. So King Tut's one of those Pharaohs that I think pretty much everybody has heard of because the discovery of his tomb was extremely big news. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting though, is that his history is kind of uh, very unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. It's not like he was this, you know, great King that lived a very long time and all of that. In fact, his his life was rather short. But King Tut ruled Egypt during the 18th dynasty, roughly 3,300 years ago. And obviously at that time period, ancient Egypt was one of the most powerful empires in the entire world. Um, You know, they definitely, if you look at their history and you look at the structures that they created, we've talked about this so many times on this Mm -hmm. show, but the pyramids of Giza and just, you know, their language, their religion, Uh, the spirituality surrounding the Egyptians and what they actually knew about the universe is actually just truly astounding. I mean, Mm -hmm. for that time period for so long ago, it really seemed like they knew a lot about life and death as well. They did. They had a wealth of knowledge that we didn't even have, you know, it's just a different type of intelligence. I think they were more spiritually connected than us. Oh yeah. Way more spiritually connected than we are now. And I think there's probably a large part of their history and knowledge that has either been completely lost to time and, you know, destroyed. And I think there's so much information that we just still don't know about them because we're just kind of gathering the pieces that are left over from ancient Egypt. And, you know, Egyptologists are trying to understand, you know, what, what life was like for them. And we've learned a lot, but there's still a lot we don't 
fully understand. Now, King Tut actually became Pharaoh of Egypt when he was only nine years old. So if you think about that for a moment, that's so young to all of a sudden be essentially king of an empire. Yeah, that's exactly what he was. Yeah. How crazy. Like imagine a nine-year-old. What do you even do though? Like at nine years old, your comprehension of life in, in general is fairly small. But then again, in Egypt, I feel like he probably was more prepared than we even know for the mm-hmm. role and you know from a young age i'm well, sure their lifespan were... was a lot shorter so they got people going a lot younger i believe king tut was actually one of the youngest if not the youngest pharaoh uh in the entire empire of egypt and because he was so young when he became pharaoh he was nicknamed the boy king now what's interesting is that he died at only 19 years old so he lived a very very short life and we'll talk about how we believe his life ended, but only 10 years uh, that he was Pharaoh. And the fact that he is now the most well-known Pharaoh that many of us even know about is, is really interesting. So during the time that King Ta actually ruled Egypt, obviously Egypt had great wealth. They had great knowledge. You know, the aesthetics of their culture is truly unmatched. I feel like Mm -hmm. from any other culture in the world, I know like the Roman empire, they did a lot. And, you know, Greece has a ton of, of history to it. But I think Egypt by far is the most interesting. I think it's probably one of the most complex. And, Very complex. And yeah. one of the most mysterious uh, civilizations that uh, we know of. But everyday objects in Egypt were made of gold, precious stones. They really valued uh, gemstones and crystals. Mm-hmm. It was very, very big um, in their religious practices. They and understood the power. That's the thing is they did understand the power of crystals and energy fields and all of that. So gold everywhere as well. They loved yeah. gold. They also loved lapis. Yeah, they did love lapis. Love lapis. Lots of that. So King Tut, when he was just a boy, he enjoyed taking his dog to the desert for ostrich hunting. Just a <laughs> just a normal day, taking the dog out for a little jog through the desert to hunt ostriches. And King Tut's parents were siblings. That's a bit of a problem. <laughs> yeah, just a bit. <laughs> yeah. Just he, a bit. And he actually married his half sister. And they actually had two daughters, but both were born prematurely and died shortly after. That's wild. I mean, probably because they were inbred too. I yeah. Mean, that could have caused a lot of these issues. Definitely. And they believe that, you know, a lot of these diseases that he developed uh, in his short life was a direct result of the fact that uh, there was incest in the family. Um, and in fact, they believe that he suffered from various different ailments, including a rare bone disorder called Kohler disease and malaria. And the bone disease could have caused his left clubbed foot, Mm. or it could have been just a result of his family's history of incestual relationships. I bet a lot of people looked weird back then because this has got to be really common. Yeah. I mean, if the Pharaohs are doing it, you got to think a lot of other people are doing it Maybe they didn't even know it was an issue. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. Imagine how people look back then. Yeah. Wow. Well, what's interesting is they actually based, you know, after we found King Tut and we recovered his mummy uh, with modern technology and CT scans, they actually did a virtual autopsy of King Tut and they developed a computer generated image of what he looked like. And he is definitely a a sight to behold. Um, He he walked on a deformed foot his most of his life and walked with a cane because they actually found 130 walking canes in his tomb. Yeah, he definitely looks um, a little weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely a, a, a little odd, oddly shaped. He's got some nice hips. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. But look at his foot, how his foot is like yeah, just Whoa. all messed that up. That looks really painful. Yeah. And that's just one of the many issues that he had. And, you know, they think most of it was a result of the inbreeding Mm -hmm. that caused this. And you got to think that it's got to be multi-generational. If, if it's this bad too, you like, it takes time for genetics to, you know, sort of evolve over time and pass down these, these Mm -hmm. traits from incest, I believe. So it's probably been going on for, for a very long time. Now, as far as King Tut's death goes, we still don't have a definite answer. Obviously, about how he died. However, we do believe he died very abruptly. Uh, some believe that he may have died from injury sustained in a chariot accident, which you know what a chariot is, right? The horse is pulling yeah. the little thing that they used to ride around on. Mm-hmm. Those things are, are pretty cool. 
And when he was buried in his tomb, he actually had a severe leg fracture. So some believe it could have been from that accident or it was a war wound, which I have a hard time believing is a war wound that, you know, little King Tut was out there fighting, you know, with his conditions. Well, I mean, I guess I don't know if that was in their, like a part of their culture for Kings to fight. It depends on the culture completely. A lot of cultures will send Kings out and it's yeah. like part to yeah. improve yourself and keep your, maybe he was, yeah. Spot, but I don't God, know. That, that's brutal. I know. Despite all those handicaps, like, well, what age was he out doing that? I mean, if it was close to his death, he would have been 19, 17, 18, 19 years old. I mean, yeah, still, that's still like a kid pretty much at that point. I know. Yeah. But old enough to go to war in this country. So very true. You can <laughs> sign up at the ripe old age of 18. Yep. Well, what's crazy about his leg injury was, is that his whole kneecap was missing. That's wild. And they believe that his bone because it was so fractured actually pierced the skin and created a, a gaping wound that caused him to oh. bleed out essentially from it. And that could have caused uh, essentially his death. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, they believe he died between one and five days after this accident or, or wound happened. Okay. But a lot of other people believe that King Tut was actually murdered and either clubbed in the head or he was poisoned because I think, the, the thought was, is that he was such a young Pharaoh that there was probably people around him in kind of the inner circle Oh yeah, that, you know, it's, it's like a classic movie, you know, yeah. like there's always like that. Lion King shit. Yeah, <laughs> that's, you know what I was thinking? So yeah, there's somebody in the family or in the inner mm-hmm. circle. Like some people believe it was a high priest or yeah. something that may have poisoned him because you know, as, as long as there's been humans, there's always been this fight for power and, you know, fight for, the top of, of the order. So a lot of people believe that he may have just been straight up taken out kind of assassinated because they're like, maybe they're like, we don't want this type of person representing Egypt, you know? And they're like, he's got all these deformities. He's all messed up. So maybe we want somebody else. I bet a lot of people were back then though. Right. Maybe. Yeah. But I mean, if you think about usually the people in royalty or in, Mm -hmm. you know, the Pharaoh's family, you know, you think of them as these regal, you know, kind of, classy looking people and yeah, i guess that's possible to have a person that was handicapped as the strong leader because you got to think about the time period in these empires like the empires were all about controlling their areas of land and their civilization mm-hmm. so you want to portray yourself as being strong a strong leader you know you look at rome and caesar and all that like you always think of like they ruled by an iron fist you know like they they ruled it was a strong leader and so i i think this idea that he was murdered could definitely be there could be some truth to that for sure maybe like a successor or like a brother or someone who would have yeah. been king if it wasn't for him mm-hmm. so to my point about the high priest apparently there's a theory that the, one of the high priests may have had a motive to kill king tut because king tut had no living heirs which would mean that the priest would actually inherit the throne if he died so that that's one of the reasons why they believe he may have been murdered but Egyptians believe that when people died, they took whatever possessions were buried alongside them to mm-hmm. the afterlife. So all of the royalty were buried with thousands of objects and a different range of objects because they truly believe that these objects would be available to them once they passed. Maybe they are. Yeah, maybe they are. Maybe there's something to that. Whatever you get buried with. They always say like you can't take it with you when you die. But maybe, maybe you, you can. do because <laughs> they were they were doing that. God, what, wouldn't that be crazy if that was the truth and we're all like going to the other side with nothing, you know, <laughs> we're just like, maybe we show up as just like, naked. Oh, you didn't get the memo. You're supposed to like have what you need. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You like start this grand journey and like, so, like the mass majority of people just start it naked and afraid. <laughs> like you get dropped on another planet and it's just naked and afraid. Well, out there. I don't think people are buried <laughs> naked normally. Well, that you, doesn't matter. I guess they're like wearing a, like a nice suit. True. That's true. Something. Maybe like your suit goes up. with you. Well, still. <laughs> well, there, maybe that's why people do that. There's some like, you know, something to that. Maybe. Well, if that's the case, then I want to be buried with like all the supplies I need, uh, you know, uh, winter clothing, summer clothing. Just <laughs> bury me with some weed. I'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> bury me in Gucci. <laughs> oh my God. So what we do know 
about the ancient Egyptians is that, you know, not only they believe that life went on in the afterlife and you needed all of this stuff to go with you. And in order to facilitate this, they would bury the royalty and pharaohs in tombs. You know, obviously the mm-hmm. commoner folk didn't get their own tombs because, you know, you had to have money and, and possessions right. to, to warrant that. To be someone. But the problem was is that, you know, you put all these pharaohs into tombs and kings and queens into tombs. There's always going to be people who are going to want to break into that shit and steal yeah, what they have. It does make it risky. More reason to grave rob. Exactly. So that's where the whole idea of the curse comes from is that Egyptian pharaohs had their tombs cursed so that the people that would come and break into their tombs would be cursed afterwards. And more on that here in a bit. But King Tut's tomb was no exception. His was pretty modest, though, compared to some of the other pharaohs out there. It feels like they didn't have like a ton of respect for the guy, you know, like they're just kind of like. You know, we'll give you a, a, a base, the basic package, you know. And it's interesting how he ended up being known as one of the. He's like well, the most famous yeah. one that we mm-hmm. know of. You right. know? Exactly. Can anybody name three pharaohs? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's like we all know. King Tut. King Tut. Because <laughs> it's easy to remember Tut. Yeah. It and is I feel easy. like you learn about him in school too. Yeah. Like yeah. I learned about him so young. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's because we grave robbed him we yeah you know we yeah. broke Terrible. into his tomb and and yeah it was a big spectacle in it the was media and stuff it yeah. was so when king tut died he was buried into a tomb with an impressive number of items and all that wouldn't be discovered for another three thousand years but after he was buried those who wanted him gone removed his name from official records to erase him from egypt's history because much of what we know about King Tut actually comes from unearthing ancient Egyptian tombs. So the, uh, the only reason we know about mm-hmm. him is because we've, we fucking found him. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like a shrine to them in a way. And, and back to my point that I think they kind of were kind of ashamed of him and really makes me think that he was murdered uh, because of his whole, whole physical situation. I feel like they just did not want to have a Pharaoh that was like him. And what's so interesting is King Tut's father, uh, I cannot say this. Can you say it? Akenton. Akenton. Is that really how you say it? Akenaton. Akenaton. Mm, we'll see. We'll see what people think of that. <laughs> but he was a much more prominent ruler and made some big changes in Egypt, possibly the biggest changes to ever happen in their history. He actually changed their religious belief, which was a huge part of Egypt, their spiritual beliefs and he forced people essentially to switch from believing in multiple gods uh, to believing in just one, Ra, the sun god, and worshiping Aten, the sun. And the reason why this was such a big deal is because in ancient Egypt, you know, second to the pharaohs was the high priest. Mm-hmm. If you were a high priest in Egypt, you had a ton of power and influence over not only the pharaoh, but also the people of Egypt. So when uh, Akunatan actually did this, it really pissed the high priests off because a lot of their power and influence was taken away because obviously if there's only one deity, then A, you probably don't need as many high priests mm-hmm. because the high priests really led the ceremonies and rituals and in, in worship of the different deities. And so they did not like this at all. But what's interesting is that after King Tut's father died, the priests quickly took the power and influence back. And what's interesting is that it, I really believe that the high priest had something to do with the death of King Tut because my guess is that King Tut probably would have followed in his father's footsteps yeah. and, and probably would have kept up the belief system that his father put in place. And so obviously the high priest did not want this to happen. Mm-hmm. And to yeah. prove that fact even more is that they actually ended up cursing King Tut's father to quote, separate his body and spirit forever like oh damn that they, sounds they, terrible they literally did not yeah want him to even be able to continue in the afterlife so that to me seems like some motive for murder for mm-hmm. king tut absolutely so let's go ahead and get into talking about the discovery of king tut's tomb because that leads us down the road to the pharaoh's curse now british archaeologist howard carter set out to discover king tut's tomb in the early 20th century and his expedition was financed by lord Conifan and Carter's friend, George Herbert, the fifth Earl of Conifan. Now, Howard Carter's team searched for years working within centimeters of the tomb's interest before moving to another location. So they got so fucking close to discovering it and then they moved to another location. But allegedly, Howard Carter always knew where the tomb was located. But if he did, he was taking his time to try and find it. In 1922, 
Lord Conovan summoned Howard Carter to England and said he was pulling his funding. But in order to keep the funding in place, Carter had to plead with him for another season of excavations. He was actually able to convince Lord Conovan to agree, and the search continued for King Tut's tomb. Now, one of the reasons why King Tut's tomb was so hard to find is because when the, the workers actually built the tomb for King Tut, they actually built makeshift huts over the top of his tomb while working on another tomb. So that helped keep King Tut's tomb hidden very, very well. But in a short time, a member of Howard's crew found a small step cut into the rock that led to the discovery of 15 hidden steps to an ancient doorway. This doorway was sealed and the doorway said, Tutankhamun. So after Howard Carter believed he had found King Tut's tomb, he sent word back to Lord Conovan in England about their discovery, and then he made his way back to Egypt in just two weeks, which was record time in those days. Can you imagine waiting two weeks to open the tomb you've been looking for for months? I'm sure he was dying inside. Oh like. my gosh, yeah. But also I think I would be low-key scared to open a, a pharaoh's tomb. Especially well, if you know anything about Egypt. Yeah, that's true. He should be scared with all he knows, but it seems like those guys are never that worried about it. No, they're, they're skeptical. So King Tut's tomb was discovered at the Theban necropolis in the Valley of Kings, which was an elite Egyptian city of the dead across from the Nile from Luxor, Egypt. So on November 26, 1922, four months before the official unveiling, Howard Carter and his financial backers, Lord Carnivan and George Herbert went to the Valley of Kings by themselves. Now the outer door of the tomb showed evidence of forced entry because the tomb had been entered and resealed at least twice. So the men had no idea if King Tut was even going to still be inside his own tomb. Now the doorway that they found led to King Tut's burial chamber, but it was blocked with objects plastered and sealed shut. And there was actually two giant statues of King Tut standing guard. So the guys decided rather than you know, excavate everything properly, clean out the room, and then break through the doorway, which would take about two weeks. Mm -hmm. They decided that they would come back that night in secret. And when they returned to the site, they decided to go through a small hole that was used by looters hundreds of years ago. And when they went through the small hole, they found an intact burial chamber with a gold shrine in it. And after they saw that, they quickly snuck out and then they swore they wouldn't tell a soul. Now, what's interesting about this, though, is that Howard Carter claimed that after this night, he immediately alerted the Egyptian antiquities authorities about what they had found. However, Lord Carnivan told a different story. So based on Lord Carnivan's story, it sounds like Howard Carter actually did go through and stole items from King Tut's tomb and then sold them on the black market for profit, despite him sort of denying that accusation. At this point, Lord Conovan has been a fortune on the excavation in order to just discover the tomb, let alone all the money that was going to be needed in order to process the site and then remove all the content within. And in order to help recover some of the money he had invested, he signed a deal with the Times of London for 5,000 pounds, giving the paper exclusive access to any information or stories regarding King Tut's tomb. The steel caused a ripple effect with other newspapers. Without access to information, papers embellished stories, and in some cases just made up things in order to avoid being behind the times because, you know, the media is, they always want to compete with each other and have the, you know, the next best story. But this deal worked. Lord Carnivan profited from every related story the Times sold, and those profits continued long after he ended up dying. Now, on February 17th, 1923, 20 people were invited to witness the official entry into King Tut's burial chamber. The outer rooms of the tombs were filled to the brim with ancient possessions and treasure. Just think about that for yeah. a second, how cool that, that be must really have been. Cool. You know, like I, th I think so one exciting. of the coolest things in life would be to make a discovery of treasure. Yeah. You know, like Definitely. growing up, I used to like, like Treasure Island and all of these yeah. like Oak books Island. and stories that about gold and like, you know, you know that, uh, 
Daffy Duck cartoon where he's like diving into oh, the of course the mountains of gold. I'd be like, that'd be so cool to just like <laughs> discover a room of gold and just swim in it and stuff. Especially if you've been looking for something for years, you know, yeah. and then you've made it your life's work to walk in there. You'd be like, ah, I can't even imagine how you know, excited you'd be. Like those oh, poor well. guys on Oak Island, man. Oh my god, <laughs> they've been Seriously. at it for so long. Dude. I would be so disappointed by now. You think they're still out there? Maybe with coronavirus, they've had to stop. <laughs> oh no, they're they're still going at it. There's still seasons of that show coming out and they like they drum up a little thing here and there but Mm -hmm. this big fortune that's supposedly there i don't know if it's if it's there (laughs) when do you give up really truly crazy if it was never there to begin with (laughs) oh god yeah it'll be sad sad day for those guys oh yeah just like if they opened this tomb and there was nothing in there like imagine if nothing was left which is probably what they were expecting considering they had already realized it was broken into yeah they probably thought there was like gonna be nothing Mm -hmm. left but the fact that it was literally still packed with treasure was which they probably would have huge. taken way more back then, but mm-hmm. you know, they were probably riding on maybe on camel or just walking. You yeah. Know? How much can they carry? The stuff is heavy. Yeah. Well, I mean, they had enough money to probably bring in like caravans. No, and, I'm talking about the first people that, Oh the yeah. The reason why they didn't. Take oh, the everything. looters. Yeah. 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 Well, they went through a small hole too. And, and a lot of these treasures are really large and mm-hmm. you know, heavy. Right, so it'd, that's be, a good point it'd be difficult to take it you know, through the hole, but they probably did take stuff you could fit in your pockets. Yeah, and I'm sure they took some stuff. things, but yeah. How cool would it be though, to like hold something from ancient Egypt like that it made by, by them. That'd be so cool. Remember that necklace you bought me that was from, it was made by Egyptians. From oh, ancient it had Egypt. Uh, Egyptian beads. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They were and, like th- really old beads. Yeah. Thousands of years old. Yeah. And you broke it, I think. No. <laughs> or you lost no, it. No, you vacuumed it up. <laughs> Oh my and you God. Don't tell you them. didn't bother to open the vacuum. No, we did. And we like, did. Could it not was find shattered it. because those are <laughs> delicate. They're like made out of, Oh yeah, it was shattered. Yeah. <laughs> they were like authentic ancient Egyptian beads. I'm necklace. so upset about that. I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> you vacuumed them up. Yeah. I was so <laughs> pissed oh off. God. So at this point in time, they discovered this room full of treasure, but they had yet to discover the actual sarcophagus mm-hmm. and mummified body of King Tut. Now, the guests that they invited to this big, you know, unveiling of King Tut's burial chambers included archaeologists, Egyptian dignitaries, and government officials, and they were all crammed in this small chamber leading into the central area of the tomb, and they watched as Howard Carter moved the stone filings between the different rooms. What's just cool and and crazy about these tombs is just like how complex they are. Uh, They had these multiple chambers. You had your entrance steps, which then led you down a passage into the antechamber, which then had an annex that is all sealed off by these different doors. Like they really thought out these tombs when they built them. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's really cool. So Howard, you know, everybody's watching Howard Carter attempting to get into the next room uh, from this first antechamber. And 10 minutes later, he had dug a small opening large enough to see into the inner chamber, revealing the shrine made of solid gold. And inside was King Tut buried in a solid gold inner coffin nestled within three other layers of coffin. So in this chamber of the tomb, there was six dismantled chariots. There was sandals, jewelry, golden statues, loincloths, oars, lotus flowers, decorative boxes, boats, and food, including ancient meat, berries, loaves of bread, lentils, dates, and a basket of chickpeas. Literally everything you need for your uh, next next adventure. (laughs) But just the pictures of it is just so cool. Yeah, it really is. Like to find such preserved artifacts Mm -hmm, from thousands of years ago is just like, I feel like that never happens now. Like we never have these grand discoveries. I think there'd of, be more. Yeah, you would think that with modern technology, we'd be able to find everything. Well, I think they do find a lot of them, but a lot of them have already been robbed and there's nothing left. It's just such a shame that people are willing to rob this and steal it for their own gain. And yeah, this stuff humidity. ends up on the black market. People don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah, people don't <laughs> give a shit about history, man. But it ended up taking the crew eight years to catalog everything in the tomb and transfer all 5,000 objects to Cairo's museum. Now, when they finally got to King Tut's mummified corpse, they discovered that it was very mishandled. Embalming resin was found inside his leg fracture, proving that his injury happened before he died. However, he also had a broken foot, which could have occurred in modern times when his corpse was moved. 
King Tut's corpse was actually so mangled that his head was detached from his body and there was a hole punctured into his head after they removed his mask that was on him. Damn. His body was stuck in a place by resins that were used to mummify him and to remove him. Howard Carter ordered a crew member to heat a knife and slice through Tut's body, causing a bunch of new injuries. Oh, great. Stupid idiots. <laughs> like it's been perfect for thousands of years and then you cut it with a hot knife. I'm sorry, but what the fuck is that? <laughs> Seriously. Just to remove him, I guess, because he was like st literally stuck in there. So I guess the only way to get him out would be to cut him. Uh, otherwise, there would be no removing him. But still, I feel like maybe like take a step back and think of a yeah. slightly better way <laughs> yeah. to do this. Instead like, of making new injuries on this dude, he's thing. been preserved for thousands of years. Should yeah. they bring in like some doctors or something to do this? <laughs> doctors. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like he's just going at him with a knife. That's, All right. Seems give me the knife. Crazy. <laughs> like, Seriously. On the spot like that, shouldn't they like make a decision, make a plan and make sure make that's the best way to do it? No, get know. a hot knife and start hacking away. <laughs> yeah. Get the machete out. <laughs> And I don't know about you, but I'd be a little scared to be taking a knife to a mummy like this. Yeah, like, that's a good happened? point. Like, is there going to be a transfer no. yeah, or something? Yeah, that's or a absolutely. really good point. <laughs> if you like cut them open and something like spews out or if there's oh, like, like a disease or something. Yeah. Are they like stuffed him with like toxic material yeah. or something? How would you know? Ooh. It seems like very careless. It's not like these guys are in there with hazmat suits. No, so. just the fact that they, you know, they possibly could curse, be cursed. You yeah. know, they know of the curses. Why would you, I don't to know. To just disregard all of that. I wouldn't just, be part of that. You would <laughs> not find me in a tomb. Absolutely mm -mm. not. Mm -mm. Well, and to take a knife to him also made it much harder for us later on to actually figure out how he died. Right. Yeah. All these injuries could have just been from mm -hmm. Howard Carter's dumb ass and his, <laughs> his crew slice and king tut to what pieces year is this again i forget this was in 1923 when they were oh doing yeah this. okay so could have done a lot better job if it were 2020 yeah well, i guess maybe. i'll give it to them it was a long time ago but yeah. still come on now yeah it seems a little it reckless. just seems a little yeah reckless and you know why not try to keep preserving what's already been preserved mm -hmm. for thousands of years rather than just start slicing it up? Seriously, they put so much work into preserving their bodies. Yeah. It's incredible the how fact well that he's even able to look like the mm -hmm. way he did after all those years. You would yeah. think they'd be reduced to a skeleton at that point. But like, who cares? Cut him up. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. What the hell? It's looks weird. like a looks very like weird. a little child. It's yeah, very he does. small. Well, he's just bones, so he's going to be kind of small. Well, there's right? no, there's more than just bones there. I mean, you still got some yeah, some skin on his face. It's not a like a bit. skeleton after three thousand years. That'd be a skeleton, man. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty preserved. It's oh, I mean, it's incredible. But yeah, there's not too much left. Now this is interesting. They found several mysterious objects inside of his tomb. This included a dagger made of an iron meteorite. I think that's so cool that they they would make weapons from meteorites, that like is very literally cool. mm -hmm. from space. They had a space dagger and a set of iron blades that was used in a burial ritual, which would help the deceased enter the afterlife, as well as an iron headrest and a golden death mask, as well as an amulet on a gold bracelet. A death mask. Yeah. Wow. Another mysterious object they discovered was King Tut's silver trumpet. It's the oldest known metal trumpet ever to exist. It was discovered alongside another one made of bronze or copper. These were military trumpets used to call troops into battle, and they were extremely stunning and well-crafted. In 1939, the trumpets were actually used for a publicity stunt by Rex Keating, a documentarian and radio presenter, and the trumpets had not been played for 3,000 years, so this guy decided to play them live on the air. What the hell? Why are we using ancient artifacts to play for fun, just for publicity? Mm-hmm. And apparently he got permission from the archaeologists and they agreed, hoping that this stunt would raise awareness for all the research that they were doing. That's cringe as hell. That really is. Yeah. And they didn't even work. They did a whole broadcast for it. And the first attempt to play it was horrible. They thought didn't it was going to just be awesome. I, yeah. <laughs> 3,000 years old. Plays beautifully. <laughs> burr, burr, burr. <laughs> <laughs> that's just so. Yeah, that's really cringe, honestly. Yeah, and so they decided to alter this ancient artifact and put a modern mouthpiece on it. And then as oh soon God. as he started playing it, the freaking trumpet shattered in his <gasps> hands. Stop. Yeah. That's oh what you my get, you gosh. asshole. Seriously, what the fuck? Dude, these guys. <sighs> Who thought that was a good idea? Yeah. 
There's like no regulation of ancient artifacts. Like what? No, no respect for it either. No. But they were able to repair the trumpet apparently and the broadcast was rescheduled. And this time... <laughs> we're going to try again, guys. Yeah. They're like, all right. Round one failed, oh my but God. let's try it again. So they actually played... A guy from the British Army played this trumpet for 150 million listeners wow. live on the radio. And you got to hear what this thing sounded like. Okay, here's here's the thing about these trumpets, though, is that maybe even the trumpets had been cursed because three months after this broadcast, we just heard Britain entered World War Two. Oh, wow. Really? Yep. That's interesting. And then the silver trumpet was played again right before the six day war between Egypt and Israel in 1967. Oh, wow. And then the third time the trumpet was played was in 1990, right before the Gulf War. And then the last time they were played was in 2011, right before the Egyptian revolution. Wow. So is it possible that huh. these trumpets are cursed and led to the actual start of wars? That's because really interesting. if you think about it, that's pretty, that's a lot of coincidence. Yeah, that there, really like. is. There's quite a few examples there. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, hmm. well, we do know that they would, you know, curse these, mm -hmm. the tomb, they'd probably curse the objects as well. Yeah. To mm -hmm. protect them from being stolen because they, they know that somebody is going to come try to steal that and use mm -hmm. it for their, their own good. So and maybe it's pretty disrespectful to play it. Yeah, I think so. Because you're not supposed to have it in the first place. Yeah, yeah, you were never supposed to have it, period. Right. They clearly didn't want anyone to find it. So to go, go out and play it, not smart. But nearly two years after the tomb's discovery, the sarcophagus or stone coffin that held King Tut's body was opened. If you've ever seen uh, the Mummy, or the or what's that movie called? The I don't know. I've never seen that. I don't think. Yeah, you have. Have I? <laughs> right at the museum. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> yes, the have you seen Ben Affleck in Night at the Museum? Ben Affleck, it's <laughs> even ben I know it's not Ben Affleck. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Ben Stiller. Yes, Ben Stiller. <laughs> Wait, what is the movie? It's called The Mummy. It's just the Mummy movie. You know, I like the I Mummy ride that. at Universal. I never saw that. I've never saw. I've the been mummy? on the ride, but I've never been on. I've never seen that. Well, the Mummy is about. Uh, a cursed tomb basically okay and all this crazy shit happens uh, that's the synopsis but maybe that's what happened in real life so on october 28th 1925 howard carter and his team opened the innermost of the three nested coffins and that's when they found king tut's gold death mask staring back at them that's a, that's got to have been a little creepy to to start pulling the you know the coffins off of them. And it's interesting how they nested the coffins inside of each other, like mm -hmm. they had multiple layers to it. Mm -hmm. But this gold death mask that he had is one of the most well known objects from King Tut's tomb, and it was made in the image of the Egyptian god of the afterlife, Osiris, because obviously Egyptians believe that those buried with a mask of Osiris would rule the kingdom of the dead. So if you've never seen King Tut's mask, it's truly a work of art because they decorated it with turquoise, quartz, carnelian, and lapis lazuli. So crystals, they obviously, there's mm -hmm. obviously a reason behind that, not just the fact that they're beautiful, but you know the energy that they actually have is uh, definitely a part of that as well. Hieroglyphs inscribed on the mask's shoulders are an ancient spell from the Book of the Dead, an ancient Egyptian book of spells buried with the dead in order to protect them in the afterlife. And it wasn't until November 11th, 1926, that King Tut's body could actually be studied, which gave them a fuller view of how he looked while he was alive. So obviously we talked about how his appearance was definitely a, a little, a little bit interesting. And there's actually a theory out there that Egyptians actually bred with alien species. I think we've talked about this before. 
So a lot of people have speculated that perhaps they were, you know, human alien hybrids and that's how they were able to advance so quickly. And maybe that's why, you know, some of the Egyptians look so bizarre, specifically King Tut. Maybe, or they're just inbred. Yeah, or they're just inbred, exactly. But let's go ahead and get into the curse of the Pharaoh. But before we do, we'd like to thank our last sponsors for today. So as we adjust to the new normal of the world and just how we conduct business, we need to do it smarter than ever. And luckily, there's Stamps.com to help make things easier. Thousands of small business owners have discovered the benefits of Stamps.com in recent months. They've been able to keep their business running and avoid the crowds at the post office, all from their own computers. With Stamps.com, you can print postage on demand and avoid going to the post office, and you'll save money with discounted rates you can't even get at the post office. So basically, Stamps.com brings all of the mailing and shipping services you need right to your computer, and you can do all of it from the comfort of your own home. No more waiting in line at the post office or even going through the hassle of carrying everything that you need to there. You can do it all right from home, plus you save money, and you can schedule a pickup right from your computer, so you never even have to leave your house. So with that being said, right now our listeners can get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage in a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to stamps.com and click on the microphone at the top of the home page and type in mile higher. That's stamps.com and enter mile higher. So the other night we were making some margaritas and we had a couple and we decided we wanted more, but our ice machine wasn't making enough ice. So we had to get ice, but we couldn't drive to go get ice because we were drinking. And so Postmates came in clutch for us. They went to the store for us, got some ice and a couple other items that we needed and brought it safely to our front door with no contact delivery, which is awesome with everything going on right now. And that's just one example of the many times that we have used Postmates in a pinch. And now they have Postmates Pickup, which we have been using to order takeout from all our local favorite restaurants. So download Postmates on iOS or Android, find your favorites and get anything that you want delivered within the hour. And for a limited time, Postmates is giving our listeners $100 of free delivery credit to use within your first seven days. To start your free deliveries, just download the app and use the code MILEHIRE. That's code MILEHIRE for $100 of free delivery credit for your first seven days when you download the Postmates app. Anything that you need, anytime you need it, Postmates that shit. All right, let's talk about the curse of the Pharaoh. So just three years after King Tut's tomb was discovered, 11 people connected through family or finances to King Tut's tomb opening were dead. And six of the 26 people who witnessed the tomb's opening were dead within the next 10 years. By 1935, 21 people who were all connected to the opening of King Tut's tomb were all dead. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. And if I feel like if they did, they would be a lot more, you know, open to the idea that things like curses can exist because it seems like it's pretty obvious there was a curse in place here. Yeah. And a lot of people believe that, you know, we shouldn't be disturbing the dead at all. The fact Mm -hmm. that we're going into people's tombs altogether is just wrong in itself. Mm -hmm. And at the same time though, because of all this happening, there was a lot of, you know, different types of, of media and, you know, books and things like that that were released to kind of sensationalize you know, the discovery of King Tut and just yeah. Egyptian culture in general. Like mm-hmm. there was sort of this frenzy after, there after was. all, all of this happened and, mm-hmm. you know, Egyptian culture became really popular. So basically during this period of history, there is an Egyptian frenzy happening both in literature, you know, stories are being written about mummies that are cursed. And so all of this sort of played into this idea of the curse of the Pharaoh, because a lot of people just think that it was sort of, you know, this made up thing that, you know, conveniently fit this narrative of all these people that died. And therefore it was kind of, you know, their deaths Mm -hmm. were uh, a reason for this curse and vice versa. But in reality, you know, it seems like his tomb may have in fact been cursed because shortly after it was opened, the curse claimed its first victim. And one of the main reasons that a curse was even suggested at all was because inscriptions found within the tomb were translated by the press, which obviously fueled a lot of people's belief in the curse because the encryptions said, they who enter this sacred tomb shall swift be visited by wings of death. Another one said, I am the one who prevents the sand from blocking the secret chamber and was translated by the press to read, 
I will kill all of those who cross this threshold into the sacred precincts of the royal king who lives forever. I think that's pretty clear. Yeah. Ancient Egyptians had a good reason to curse anyone who disturbed their tomb. Not only could the treasures within it be robbed, but disturbing the deceased could prevent them from entering the afterlife according to their beliefs. So yeah, it makes sense why they would curse it. And I think it's important to remember that, you know, magic as you, as Mm -hmm. you would refer to this as was very real in Egyptian culture. And Mm -hmm. it was as real as anything else. They really truly believed that magic was real and that obviously curses are a part of that. And, you know, I honestly think that it's probably real as well. So I, I think too. they really knew knew something that a lot of us, especially at that time period, would have just dismissed as, oh, that's just fable. You know, it's mm-hmm. just, it's not, there's no truth to it at all. But on the other hand, another possible explanation, rather than it being an actual curse being placed on the tomb, was that potentially there could have been dangerous mold that was found within the tomb as well as on the mummies, including hazardous bacteria. And this theory is called the tomb toxins theory because a lot of people, you know, who don't believe in magic Mm -hmm. or don't think magic could be real, Mm -hmm. believe that it could have just been mold or something like that that was found toxins in the air inside of the tomb that would have ultimately led to health problems in the years following from anyone exposed to it. Because oftentimes in ancient tombs, we've uh, found formaldehyde, ammonia gas, and hydrogen sulfide uh, inside of these sealed coffins. So people could experience a lot of the symptoms that uh, these individuals that died as a result of the curse of the Pharaoh actually uh, exhibited. But a lot of the people died in very strange ways that have nothing to do with that. Indeed. So whether or not the curse of the Pharaoh is actually real is really up to what you believe. But the number of deaths that ensued after King Tut's tomb was opened is truly just bizarre. So six months after first stepping into King Tut's tomb, Lord Conovan himself was dead at just 57 years old. When Lord Conovan was in his mid thirties, he was in a serious motor accident and never fully recovered. He was weak and developed chest infections easily. During the excavation, he was so weak and frail that he spent most of his time suspended in a cage lined with medical gauze. After the official unveiling of the tomb in February of 1923, the excavation efforts were put on hold for a brief break. Lord Carnivan and his daughter, Lady Evelyn Herbert, took a trip south to Aswan. During this brief holiday, Lord Carnivan was bitten by a mosquito on his cheek, and after he returned to Egypt, he cut the bite open while shaving. After this, he felt extremely ill and was rushed to Cairo for medical attention. He had developed blood poisoning and pneumonia. And one by one, he started to lose his teeth mysteriously. Damn, that is rough, man. And around this particular time, a novelist named Marie Corelli published her speculations in the New York World Magazine. And she included a quote from an obscure book that said anyone who disturbed a sealed tomb would receive a dire punishment. Two weeks later, Lord Carnivan actually died of a bacterial infection he suffered. At the very moment he died, the power grid of Egypt failed. And back in England, his beloved dog, Susie, let out an eerie howl and dropped dead as well. And the cut on Carnivan's cheek may have been in this exact same spot as a healed lesion found on King Tut's cheek they found during an autopsy. But Lord Carnivan had been buried without an autopsy six months prior. Wow, just those series of events is just crazy. It really is. Like, is that just all coincidence or, or no? Six weeks before Lord Cunovan died, Arthur Weigel, a previous inspector general of antiquities to the Egyptian government, recalled Carnovan joking with a reporter as he stepped into the tomb. Weigel told his friend, quote, if he goes down in that spirit, I give him six weeks to live. And by 1934, Weigel was also dead. And obviously it was a big deal that Lord Carnovan had actually died. And after he did, the amount of coverage that the curse of the Pharaoh got really just blew up across the globe. Yeah. What's interesting is that the creator of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, told reporters that, quote, an evil elemental spirit, which was created by priests and left in the tomb, was the one that actually killed Lord Carnivan. What's also interesting is that fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, who is also superstitious, actually ordered for 
a Egyptian mummy that was given to him as a gift to be removed from his palace at once. I would do the same thing. Yeah, Get that I'm, shit out of here. Seriously. Experts actually agree that Lord Carnivan was not killed by, you know, the tomb toxin theory, the mold, the fungus bacteria, or any other substance from the tomb. So what was it that actually killed him? The curse of the Pharaoh man. Mm -hmm. They should not have done that. Nope. And the strange death didn't stop there. Not by a long shot. A week before finding King Tut's tomb, Howard Carter bought a canary to cheer him up. And the foreman on his crew said, it's a bird of gold that will bring luck. This year we will find, God willing, a tomb full of gold. But when King Tut's tomb was first found, and even before it was officially identified, Carter called it the tomb of the golden bird. And one day when he returned home, his servant stopped him at the door. He was holding a fistful of yellow feathers and looked terrified. And he told Howard that he had heard a faint, almost human cry. And when he entered the room, he saw a cobra killing the canary. Oh my gosh. But what's weird about this is that obviously cobras are, you know, found in Egypt, but it was the winter time and cobras are very rare to be seen during that time. So it was very unusual that this happened at all. Even after this happened to Howard Carter's bird, he still said he didn't believe in curses. In an interview with the New York Times, he actually said, it is rather too much to ask me to believe that some spook is keeping watch and ward over the dead pharaoh, ready to wreak vengeance on anyone who goes too near. And after he gave this interview, there was a lot of rumors going around that Howard Carter was part of a cover-up with the Egyptian authorities to suppress the knowledge of the curse of the pharaoh, which the Egyptian authorities obviously don't want the belief of a curse of the pharaoh to be out there because they still, you know, this, these discoveries bring a lot of money and wealth to the country, and obviously that's good for tourism. So they wouldn't want you know people scared to come to Egypt because of this curse. Now, what's interesting is that George J. Gould, who is a wealthy American who visited the tomb in 1923, developed a fever and died of pneumonia within a few months of visiting. Not only that, Ali Kamal Bey was an Egyptian prince who also visited the tomb in 1923. And shortly after he did, he was murdered by his wife when he was shot and killed in cold blood, all within a short period of time after visiting the tomb. So that's not mold. That's not fungus. No, I mean, I guess the only other explanation is just this is all coincidence that mm -hmm. is just happening so so soon after they visit the tomb. But no, I think there's something to be said about just bad luck in general when you are in a cursed area. Yeah, definitely. It's like an increase in bad luck happens. Mm -hmm. Even Lord Carnivan's half brother, Aubrey Herbert, suddenly went blind from a lifelong degenerative eye condition right after the tomb seal was broken. Also, Lord Carnivan's other half brother, Mervyn Herbert, also suffered an untimely death. He died from malaria and severe pneumonia in 1929. Well, that could be related to toxins, right? Maybe. Or maybe there were. Yeah, well, that's there. the thing is they're they're <laughs> saying that, you know, there was these other health conditions that they had prior that, mm -hmm. you know, contributed to their death. But who doesn't say that a curse could speed that process up because it's just the timing, the timing of how fast and the timing of their death is all around when they actually open the tomb itself. Mm -hmm. And they're all directly related to Lord Carnivan. A British archaeologist and member of the excavation team, Hugh Evelyn White, watched so many members of the crew and visitors to the tomb die that by 1924, he was so petrified of the curse of the pharaoh that he wrote a suicide note in his own blood that read, I have succumbed to the curse which forces me to disappear. And then he hung himself. That's pretty intense. So even he believes. I wonder if he was having like dreams or something or there was something that threw him over the edge and made him really believe in it. Yeah. Because... Yeah, that's that's pretty intense to be like, I have to do this. Yeah, and if not, just the mere fact of knowing that all these people related to mm -hmm. the people who excavated the tomb are dying, that he was worried that something horrible is going to happen to him maybe. Mm -hmm. So he was just like, I'd rather end it now than wait and see what happens. Even the man who x-rayed King Tut's mummy in 1924, Sir Archibald Douglas Reed, was deathly ill the very next day, and three days later he was dead. In 1925, Howard Carter gifted a paperweight that was actually a mummified hand to his friend, Sir Bruce Ingram, and the hand wore a bracelet with an inscription that read, quote, cursed be he who moves my body to him shall come fire, water, and pestilence. Not long after receiving the gift, Sir Bruce Ingram's house burned down 
And while he was working to rebuild it, the remains of the house were destroyed by a flood. Now, come on. Yeah. Literally, the inscription yeah, described exactly crazy. what happened to him. Wow. Just for owning a gift. Yeah. Just for getting a mum. Because that's rude as fuck to use someone's hand as a paperweight. You deserve <laughs> Seriously. that shit. Seriously. And the destruction didn't stop there. Another friend of Howard Carter's American Egyptologist, Aaron Ember, who was present when the tomb was opened, had his house burned down in 1926. And it took less than an hour for the fire to completely destroy the home. Aaron's wife and their son escaped and he could have ma easily made it out too, but his wife encouraged him to go back for his manuscript and he ended up dying while trying to rescue his work titled the Egyptian book of the dead. How, how eerie is that? That he was really literally, creepy. literally died trying to recover a book about the dead from Egypt. Another member of the excavation team, Sir Lee Stack, who was the governor general of Sudan was assassinated in 1924 while driving through Cairo. AC Mace, who is Howard Carter's conservator and affiliated with the Metropolitan Museum of Art, died from a mysterious arsenic poisoning in 1928. And after this high profile death, there was no stopping the spread of the curse through the media cuz cuz I think everybody's starting to believe that it's real. I mean, yeah. look how uh, that's telling in itself mm -hmm. right there like why you know, people just talking about oh the media is just trying to, you know, get attention, but it really does seem like this curse is running rampant. Richard Bethel, Howard Carter's personal secretary, died in 1929 when he was just 35 years old, and he died of a respiratory failure in a private room of a strip club in London, and he may have been smothered to death and murdered even, and he was the second person to enter the tomb after Howard did. It's like a chain reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it literally is. It's like anybody who came in contact with the tomb is, is dying. In 1930, Richard Bethel's father, Richard Luttrell Pillington Bethel, scribbled a note that read, quote, I really cannot stand any more horrors and hardly see what good I'm doing here, so I am making my exit. And after that, he threw himself from a seventh floor apartment and died on impact. Damn. Jesus. James Henry Breasted, another famous Egyptologist of the day, was soon working with Howard Carter after the tomb opened. And James himself didn't die until 1935, but his death occurred immediately after a trip to Egypt. And as word of the curse spread, the media started linking these mysterious deaths across the world to the curse of the Pharaoh. And it seemed that any curator or workman at a museum with Egyptian artifacts could be next. So people started clamoring to get rid of any possession that even resembled Egyptian relics, believing that if these objects were cursed, they could be next. In the early 1970s, Dr. Gamal Mehrez, the Director General of Egyptian Antiquities Department, died from a chronic illness. He had moved objects from King Tut's tomb for an exhibit in England, so his death was attributed to the curse as well. And around this time, David P. Silverman, an American archaeologist and Egyptologist, testified in the trial of a man who claimed he murdered his wife because he was cursed by an Egyptian relic in his home. That's a wild case. Maybe we should cover that case sometime. Yeah, I was going to say. That's a, yeah, well, that's it's like obviously a convenient excuse, but also right. is that possible? Can yeah. you be cursed to go commit a murder? That's Maybe. crazy. Imagine if that's real. And yeah. he really was. Reminds me of the devil made me do it case where the uh, yeah. first uh, demon possession came into a courtroom in the U.S. Yeah, Josh covered that on his podcast. Yeah. I'll have to link it below. Yeah, it's really interesting. So this is where the curse of the Pharaoh comes in today, because just this past year, King Tut's coffin was actually removed from the tomb where he's been for 3000 plus years in order to be restored for a new museum. They're building just outside of the great pyramids called the grand Egyptian museum. They're going to restore it and then put it in the museum for people to come and visit. And so a lot of people think that because they've now removed him from the tomb and his coffin from the tomb that the curse has now been unleashed onto the world because yeah, now it's out maybe. there free in the open. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I would go visit that shit. I oh, mean, it'd be really not. cool, but I would be honestly really scared. I would I'm be already scared. scared just going into the Egyptian uh, exhibit in the Denver nature museum and science or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And now seriously though, Oh, it's creepy. It's the whole thing creeps me out because it's like they clearly did not want to be taken out of their resting places. Right. Well, and after knowing this whole history of, yeah. of all the deaths related to his tomb and 
him, King Tut himself, would you want to go visit it? As cool as that would be to it see is it. It is so cool. And we learn a lot. And there's that debate as well. And I'm yeah. curious about what you guys think about that. Do you think it's worth it? Should we break into these tombs and, you know, for the purpose of education, is it worth it? I mean, when you're seeing these real curses play, I mean, this is clearly happening. Mm -hmm. Right? It's obviously right? happening. I, I mean, mean, the people who are dying believe it. They're killing themselves yeah. and saying, I'm doing this because I have to because I'm cursed. Like, and this is not the only example of a cursed object or cursed, you know, right, absolutely. theory or whatever yeah. it is. There's mm -hmm. tons of yeah. stories of people even taking, you know, things from historic monuments and stuff like yeah. that, taking yeah. them home and they become cursed. Yeah, specifically, uh, I think we might have talked about it in our curse, cursed objects episode. Yeah. The, uh, cursed objects the cursed sorry the cursed <laughs> objects episode joshism the most cursed objects in the world we talked about the dybbuk box yep. or the dybbuk oh, box right. yeah and that's a holocaust uh -huh. item uh -huh. that is supposed to be one of the most haunted objects in the world mm -hmm. and they believe that it's been cursed and you shouldn't open it and there's been some i believe deaths related to that as well so well if you believe in paranormal objects being cursed then why wouldn't a tomb be able to be cursed it's absolutely. the same idea absolutely i do believe objects can hold energy especially when they're you know made to hold that energy by a human or i guess something else i don't know that's just i think it's pretty obvious i think it i believe in the curse 100 percent well, and obviously skeptics are going to try to find every reason for why, you know, it's not cursed and that the, you know, they tell that to the guys all that just killed themselves because of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. And honestly, there's even been professors and scientists and people that have really studied this to try to debunk it. And they really haven't been able to completely debunk it by any means. Obviously there's <laughs> little nuances that, that might not be necessarily all true or in line mm -hmm. with with the curse but at the same time you can't deny the timing yeah. all around the opening of the tomb mm -hmm. and then god can you deny the timing of everything happening in 2020 after yeah. he's actually removed like i mean this literally happened i wouldn't end of be last surprised year. yeah and I now he's surprised. out Maybe we need to go put king tut back in the tomb yeah he's like put me back to end this this misery of the uh, year we've had i doubt that would work no nah. yeah. but is it worth a try even I don't know. God, I feel like it is. Maybe at this point it is. Like, is it even What's worth? What's it gonna? I mean, does shit get, get worse? worse? Yeah, it yeah. probably can. Actually, yeah, don't say can. that. It's Sorry. definitely could. I never mind. I take that back. <laughs> I definitely can get worse, and I'm not trying to challenge. Don't it. test King yeah, Tut. I'm he not says, Bitch, King I can Tut. make it worse. You're right. Sorry, King Tut. <laughs> Fuck. It's bad enough. <laughs> yeah. For real though, I would not be surprised if. I mean, it could be. It could be. It's been. I mean, we've lost so many people and. I mean, the whole world going through, we were just saying like how insane it is for the whole world to be going through something. I mean, that's some powerful energy. Well, if there's one civilization that was the most powerful to ever walk the earth, mm -hmm. could have definitely Egyptians. been the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you look at what they knew and where they got their knowledge from and the Sumerians and, you know, going back even farther, Lumeria and, and that whole origin story it really makes you wonder what kind of, of magic they really had and what kind of abilities and knowledge they had at the time. I mean, obviously people that are in the academic community or skeptics are, are not going to be open to these alternative histories and alternative, you know, ideas about what the Egyptians knew. And, you know, I mean, we're already finding out that they use the pyramids for essentially energy, like, mm -hmm. you know, power plants and there's a grid and it's all connected and everything. So, mm -hmm. Clearly they knew some, knew some shit. So it would not talk about me. all that in like yeah. one of our first episodes. Yeah, we did. <laughs> it's been a long time since we yeah. talked about Egypt, but I a hundred percent believe the curse of the Pharaoh. I really do. I do too. I don't think we should have uh, fucked with them at all. Mm -mm. I think you should leave people in their resting place alone. Yeah. I understand the argument for science and education. It is interesting. I, we like learning about Egyptians. It is good to learn about them. It but, is, yeah, but it's a hard argument. The like problem is, is I think it gets exploited. Yeah, I do too. It gets majorly far exploited. too much. Like the amount of knowledge and education that comes yeah. out of it's very small. And then you got to worry about the Egyptologists and the people in the academic community that want to craft the narrative to fit, you know, what they believe. Yeah, yeah, that's and the very history true. timelines. And I mean, the things that we learned about the ancient Egyptians in school is just like barely scratching mm -hmm. the surface mm -hmm. on on what they really knew and what you know, life was really like there. Or some and, of it is just straight up inaccurate. You know, 
and the way they portray magic and their beliefs is just like, oh, it's just like they were old and didn't know what they were talking about. You know, it's, we know science, you know, and <laughs> evolution, you know. So, you know, I don't know. I think we should uh, definitely be more respectful of these ancient cultures than we are. I completely agree. Um, and I'm curious if you guys have any other topics or pharaohs, you know, things related to Egypt that you would like us to cover. Yeah. There, I mean, there's I'm always endless mysteries there. Trust yeah. me. We could get into so many different, mm -hmm. different topics there. There's the, uh, the book of Enoch and there's, uh, there's so many different, different things, the ancient mystery schools of Egypt mm -hmm. and diving into the magic a little bit more. I'd love to get into uh, the magic a little bit more because there's, when you actually look into their spells and what they actually knew and what they did, it's, it's really interesting. So yeah, it really is. We'll go on and wrap up today's episode there. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode of the mile higher podcast. If you did be sure to subscribe again, if you're watching this on YouTube and that's the only place you enjoy our show, we'd love for you to go and subscribe on iTunes because it does really help support the show. It helps us, you know, boost up in the, those rankings and uh, Spotify too, whatever yeah. you use. Yeah, whatever you use. And it just helps, you know, get more people to the show. But until next time, stay safe. And stay woke.